So welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Evan Wilson from the Hadendorf Center. It's good to see so many people here. We'll have a couple more people dribble in, I'm sure, as, as we go along. Um, it's my pleasure today to introduce Ian Urbina, an investigative reporter who spent much of, much of his career at the New York Times. Uh, I guess he's sort of, are you still there? I, I'm not entirely clear on. <laughs> um, I have one, yeah, I still write for them, but I'm uh, not on staff, I'm on contract. Got it. Um, he won a Pulitzer Prize in 2009 as part of the team that broke the Elliott Spitzer story. Uh, he's contributed to The Atlantic and The New Yorker and NPR and countless other outlets. Uh, but you're all here because of his most recent book, the New York Times best-selling Outlaw Ocean, which is getting ruined by my stupid zoom background. There we go. Outlaw Ocean, Journeys Across the Last Untamed Frontier. Uh, the book began life, which Ian will tell you, as a series of uh, uh, stories published with the Times. Uh, and he traveled all around the world uh, to work on offshore crimes and stowaways and sea slavery and illegal fishing and so many more things that you'll hear about uh, shortly. Um, not only did he expand on that work when he wrote the book, he's also continuing to report on uh, crimes at sea. So he's got a recent article about China's fishing armada and its subsidizing of uh, fishing fleets in West Africa and North Korea. He published a story in the broader context for the explosion in Beirut with a number of international outlets. Uh, so many of the stories are still unfolding. And I think when um, we see the screen share, you'll see a lot of the uh, ways that you can go keep up to date with these stories uh, at his website, thelawocean.com. Um, I'm really excited that Ian's able to be with us uh, virtually today. Um, we had to reschedule the talk because he was apparently off the coast of Italy or something exotic like that, uh, embedded uh, on a ship, which he might tell us about. Uh, he's a hard guy to pin down, but I'm glad that he's here. Uh, enough from me. So welcome. And Ian, over to you and Charlotte. Thanks for being here. Thanks. Um, yeah, so this, uh, so I was a, uh, on staff at the New York Times for about 17 years. and. Um, much of that time I was um, categorized as an investigative reporter, which essentially means I had the luxury of time. Um, and, um, but the expectation that I would find uh, virgin snow, you know, kind of novel topics or new ways to tackle old topics, um, usually also, so that's the enterprise part of what I was supposed to do. The investigative part was really highlight on things that are um, broken, you know, as opposed to a beat reporter that's doing he said, she said, sort of updating on um, the basic events of yesterday, um, investigative as opposed to really kind of have almost a prosecutorial um, ambition uh, and find things that uh, most people would agree um, are in desperate need of correction. Um, and um, in the very explanatory and narrative rendering of those topics, um, there's usually suggestive, um, uh, you know, sort of fixes, but not, I mean, Charlotte, can you guide me on how I turn this off? So it's not doing that. They're muted. Sure. Um, go into your messages preferences in the top left. If I can't, um, this may be. If you click into the um, message app in your taskbar at the very bottom, it's a blue thought bubble looking app. Yeah, I've expanded the, um, I'll bag it for now and hope that. Okay. Um, <laughs> no uh, one text Ian, okay? Exactly. This is my son at school saying he needs to be picked up early. So, um, uh, so um, I was supposed to find individual stories that take a while or series, um, uh, stories that you know, topics that could be rendered as series. Um, six years ago, I finally found an editor that was willing to launch me on a series about. Um, this offshore realm and um, uh, kind of the ambition of it was to focus um, primarily on um, the humans out there, the 56 million people who work offshore um, as the sort of entry point to the world. And then secondarily to sort of back our way into um, the, the, the environmental or marine story. Um, uh, and the other ambition of the reporting was to really broaden people's awareness of the diversity, sort of expand the spectrum um, uh, that people have in their head about um, illicit, extra legal, even heroic, um, uh, you know, uh, behavior offshore. Most people, when you would mention um, Coast Guard or Navy or maritime crime, 
uh, would think of what Hollywood had helped them think of, which was, you know, the BP spill and um, Captain Phillips Somali piracy and um, ocean plastic and uh, maybe whaling. Um, but th there was not a real awareness of the plethora of other um, activities out there, sea slavery, arms trafficking, intentional dumping of oil, um, human trafficking, illegal whaling, repo men who steal ships, um, you know, and myriad other um, activities. So um, our, our goal in the reporting at the times for the first two years was to expand that um, taxonomy. Um, and um, the two years in the times, eight stories, um, melded into a book project, two more years at sea. Uh, and many of you are familiar with what came out of that. And out of the book came um, a, um, uh, a reporter who had been spoiled by too much freedom um, and didn't want to go back to the short leash of um, what I'd been doing before. And so um, I decided to um, go back to the paper for a year, did a series on ammunition um, and bullets, the global trade in bullets, um, but then realized there are so many stories that we didn't get to touch um, in the book. And there's so little journalism of a certain sort, meaning narrative, high gloss, long form, investigative um, journalism. There's so little of that occurring in the space that um, I wanted to sort of dive back in. And so I created a nonprofit called the Outlaw Ocean Project. Um, it's sort of funded by philanthropies, 50% um, and then individual subscribers and donors, the other 50%. Um, and our mission is to continue producing these stories and then we place them in sort of tier one venues. So the New Yorker, New York Times Magazine, BBC, Der Spiegel, et cetera. And then we maintain copyright over them um, and after 72 hours, we take them back and we translate them into a bunch of other languages and then push them out to other venues around the world to try to get more eyeballs on the content. Um, and so um, uh, that's sort of um, a large part of what we do. Um, one thing I'll mention briefly is in the ambition of trying to get this journalism um, to be financially sustainable on the one hand and also seen by more people on the other hand, um, we also, um, I, uh, with Charlotte and a team of three others, um, try to take the um, stories and translate them, convert them into other forms. Um, that could be podcast projects or TV series or music or animated series, um, short documentary films. Um, but we try to give the the stories more, uh, you know, more of a runway. Um, and I'll, since we're on the page, I'll give you an example of, of that. Um, Evan referred to it briefly. This is sort of a textbook. We've only been up and operating weed at Outlaw Ocean Project for a year. Um, and um, my biggest fear in making this grand shift, I'd only ever been at the Times, um, was that I'd have trouble getting outlets to um, take the reporting and publish it. Um, and um, uh, this collaboration on the, this first story was a sort of um, textbook scenario um, uh, of what I hoped might happen. On the one hand, um, it brought to bear um, a really creative and in many ways hopeful um, use of technology, uh, namely satellite technology in the form of an organization called Global Fishing Watch, uh, which I'd worked with before and know those folks really well. And they were really using various types of satellite data um, to um, figure things out that had been um, murky or mysterious. Um, and um, in this case, the focus of our shared interest. And this was a sort of trilateral collaboration. Um, Global Fishing Watch on the one hand, uh, a team of international academics from Japan, South Korea, the US, Australia, UK um, uh, on the other hand, uh, and the Outlaw Ocean Project and NBC News um, on the third uh, hand. And um, the, the, the kind of the, the, the core 
uh, questions at the center of this reporting were twofold, kind of mysteries, if you will, um, for, for which there were answers, but they were half-baked. Um, one was why in the East Sea, these waters near the Korean Peninsula, um, have we seen in the last eight or so years, this precipitous decline in the squid stock where everywhere else in the world, squid are blossoming, not for good reasons, namely overfishing has killed all their predators. But, um, but in the East Sea, you, you saw an 80% drop in eight, nine years. And that's a really huge drop. Um, the the half-baked, somewhat true answer was climate change was causing migration shifts and, and the squid uh, were following a different path and fish, fishery stock analyses were undercounting or uh, the fish had moved, the squid had moved elsewhere. Um, uh, the second kind of more, in my view, urgent mystery was um, why are all these dead bodies showing up on the coast of Japan? These are dead bodies of North Korean fishermen. Um, these are in, you know, uh, over the course of about six years, several hundred, uh, usually washing up in these rickety wooden North Korean boats. These are four or five man, you know, outboard motor boats, squid, you know, very basic squid jiggers. Um, and um, they would wash up due to the way the currents work, um, always on the coast of sometimes Russia, but usually <clears throat> on the coast of Japan. And um, the going theory, again, somewhat true, but half true, um, was that um, uh, partially worsened by the imposition of uh, sanctions, uh, but on its own accord, Kim Jong-un and the North Korean government were applying um, intense pressure for the sake of revenue, for the sake of protein, um, food security, um, intense pressure on their fishing sector, including um, moving a lot military personnel onto fishing boats. Terrible idea because many of them didn't know what they were doing, but trying to get more boats out in the water, trying to get the boats to go out further and trying to bring in more catch. And that pressure um, uh, was resulting in risk taking and risk taking in the form of going out too far, dirty fuel, um, not great engines, rickety boats, bad storms, people get stranded, stuck, starve, um, capsize or not, but end up dead and washing up on Japan shores. Um, true from what uh, analysts seem to think um, is going on there, but not the full truth. Um, so what, what we came in in this story to do was um, to um, see if this other portion of an explanation that had anecdotally bubbled up in the form of South Korean and Japanese fishermen saying they've spotted all these Chinese vessels routinely coming through their waters and heading to North Korean waters, um, as well as anonymous reports submitted to the UN by most likely they were anonymous, but most likely the Japanese and South Koreans um, saying they had documented cases of uh, uh, Chinese vessels, squid vessels, large numbers heading through South Korean waters on their way to North Korean waters. Why this matters from a governance or um, for this crowd, a Navy and law enforcement point of view is that 2017 the Security Council, China included unanimously um, imposed sanctions um, as a response to the nuclear uh, testing going on in, those in North Korea on um, North Korea and a uh, very key component of those sanctions was meant to squeeze the country economically, including their fishing sector. And there was a explicit prohibition on any foreign fishing in those waters. So if the Chinese were in large numbers sending or aware of or tacitly accepting um, uh, large numbers of these boats going in North Korean waters, um, that was a real big violation. And so what Global Fishing Watch and the academics did is they had dots on a the map. They had through scrappy, interesting tactics of satellites um, had, had sort of estimated an annual uh, number ranging from 700 to 900 vessels each year, all Chinese in North Korean waters post 2017. Um, this is a huge number. Uh, you know, China's numbers are mushy, but um, it's, it's roughly a fourth to a third of its entire distant water fishing fleet. Um, so it became, if those numbers were right, it became very difficult for the Chinese government to claim these are a few bad apples and they weren't you know, able to do anything about it. Um, 
so we, what we wanted to do at the Outlaw Ocean Project was number one, um, ground truth these um, uh, data points uh, and get footage and make it narrative, you know, um, tell a story so that average folk could care, you know, and understand. Um, so we uh, assembled a team, went to South Korea, bought our way onto a squid vessel, uh, convinced, you know, paid and convinced the captain to um, take us out. Um, I'll officially say near North Korean waters. Um, you're not allowed to go into North Korean waters. Um, and uh, doc and and essentially see if we could spot what um, the satellite seemed to be telling us, which immediately happened. Uh, we went to the sort of key um, uh, location where normally these ships um, uh, traverse. And uh, lo and behold, uh, what had looked like a single blip on the map was actually uh, a lead ship that was followed by 10 other ships who had their transponders turned off, their AIS turned off, so they were dark. And um, uh, we began following them. Uh, anyway, we, we followed them, documented them until they got aggressive with us, and then we pulled off and ran away and um, uh, told this story about a um, what you know analysts say is the largest um, discovery of an illegal fishing fleet ever. You know, nine hundred vessels, um, and put that story out. This was a perfect. This is what I left the Times to do: um, important stories, interesting stories, stories that no one else was accessing stories in located in this space, stories that are at the intersection of environment and human rights, stories that have a law enforcement element to them, um, uh, stories that also get seen, you know, um, uh, because they get run by large venues. Um, and so this was the first big piece that we uh, ran. And since then had a piece on the front page of the Washington Post about a murder caught on camera at sea and a piece coming up in the New Yorker and a piece a month ago in The Economist. So things are going well in terms of getting these outlets to run these, largely because we give it to them for free. Um, and um, uh, uh, the state of journalism is such that um, free uh, uh, reporting is um, not on offer very frequently. Um, but um, it's also journalism that not many other folks are given the budget and time to do. Um, so, um, that's an example of uh, the kind of story. Um, I'll, I'll just briefly touch on um, a second quick story. Um, I didn't look at the time. What time? Yeah, we started at noon. Okay. Um, uh, the, uh, the story that's coming up in the in the uh, the New Yorker is uh, another story that um, for this crowd may be of interest because um, it raises all sorts of interesting kind of um, questions about um, who should be doing this policing work. Um, this is a story, the, the, the heart of which is really about um, uh, unintended consequences. And in this instance, um, the unintended consequences um, at the root of um, the emergence of aquaculture and the well-intentioned and in some ways quite um, positive um, global shift toward farming fish, be it in on land ponds or in near shore pens. And the push towards aquaculture was a push that was driven largely as an effort to slow down ocean depletion and lessen the over the unsustainable overfishing and illegal fishing of wild caught, you know, fish. Um, if we could raise them on our own, then we could let those guys roam free and proliferate and stocks renew themselves. Um, uh, the, the problem that has emerged, well, a bunch of problems emerged with aquaculture, you know, standard problems that you see replicated in CAFOs, you know, sort of on land. When we began penning animals of any sort, pigs, chickens, cows, you have big problems. You have health problems. So you start pumping them with antibiotics because they're too close to each other. They're catching diseases. They're not living natural, healthy lives. Um, you have um, pollution problems from their waste uh, because you've got too many in such close quarters and that's a large amount of bad stuff that you got to get rid of. Um, uh, and you have feeding problems, meaning, you know, the drive to make money on, you know, penning animals um, means you want to accelerate um, their growth. And so you start cutting corners and beefing them up faster or, you know, fattening them up faster. So you start feeding them things that will accelerate their plumpness, right? 
And that's the, that's the CAFO story, the, the big agriculture um, uh, story. And ag aquaculture has the same narrative. And um, the specific part of that narrative that interested us is an even darker uh, twist, which is the industry has begun shifted away from the use of soy, which used to three years ago was the cheapest protein option, palletized soy to feed the fish, to fatten them up faster. Um, fish being shrimp, fish being salmon, um, other sorts, catfish, cod. Um, uh, when soy became more expensive than just fish meal, so catching forage fish, fish that typically are too small or bitter or not cost effective for human seed, but you could scoop them up, usually trawl them up in huge quantities, ground them up, pelletize it, and feed that high protein source to aquaculture fish. Um, that's when the industry switched over to a deeply worrisome phenomenon, which this industry that was so, supposed to slow ocean depletion began accelerating it because they were catching wild caught to feed farmed. Um, this struck me as a crazy kind of narrative of great interest to me, at least, and playing out in really dramatic fashion off the coast of West Africa, largely on Chinese industrial um, uh, boats that have set up processing plants, cold storage, and landed licenses with Ghana, Liberia, you know, a, a bunch of countries uh, along the coast. And uh, in, my, in this case, we went, my team went to Gambia. And um, Gambia had three main processing, fish meal processing plants, all Chinese owned. And Gambia had recent, had only recently come out of a um, repressive government after several decades under an autocratic leader. They had a new promising sort of pro-democratic set of guys in power. And um, then uh, this whole fish meal thing became a headache. The role of foreign investment, the role of foreign players, uh, to, to circumvent inspections and taxes and whatnot, uh, environmental rules, um, emergent youth protesters shutting down the plants, the return of really repressive secret police forces to get the youth back from the plant so they could be up and running. So you have really interesting um, political stability, democratic issues playing out with environmental and human rights issues, all in a law enforcement context off the coast of West Africa. And here comes Sea Shepherd. So Sea Shepherd, as many of you know, is sort of a direct action um, uh, ocean conservation group, controversial, uh, but um, for their mission, pretty effective. And they, in the last five, six years, have begun moving toward going to developing nations and offering their, their Navy, essentially, the Sea Shepherd Navy, um, huge ships and their personnel and their training and their resources and their PR machines to these countries and, say, and saying, look, you guys have no boats, Gambia, you have no real um, uh, boats that can go past 10 miles from shore. Um, the real crimes here are occurring further out. We'll bring two of our ships by, we'll help you coordinate some sort of covert law enforcement exercises. We'll train your people, we'll get press on the problem here, we'll make some arrests of some of these illegal foreign, largely foreign um, vessels, um, and um, uh, we'll help identify the, the to the world stage the problem of illegal fishing as it um, and overfishing as it plays out um, in developing nations such as Gambia. Um, furthermore, to my interest, much of the the fishing and illegal fishing going on there was for these fish meal plants, which were feeding, you know. Um, American and Norwegian, you know, uh, Chinese um, aquaculture farms. Um, so we went there, embedded, uh, did a long story about that kind of patrols um, and the deeper issues. And um, that piece is coming out in the New Yorker in a couple months. Um, so this is the sort of um, reporting we do. Um, I'll go, I'll drift off the reservation. Am I on time? Good. Um, uh, just briefly to talk about, maybe not of interest since this isn't a journalism crowd per se, but I'll indulge myself nonetheless. Um, uh, you know, I think one of the challenges for journalism generally and for legacy institutions like the New York Times, Washington Post, et cetera, is, um, you know, the cacophony of information and democratization of 
of journalism through the internet um, has made for a really crowded, short attention span kind of place. And um, finding innovative ways to access new audiences, be they Chinese, readers, be they 17 year old readers uh, anywhere, um, for example. So youth and Asia are the holy grails, um, uh, is kind of a big um, ongoing challenge for journalism outlets. Um, and um, uh, these institutions have been slow to experiment in my view. And one of the things I wanted to do when I left the Times was experiment. So the music project, um, which Charlotte will toggle over to, was one such experiment. Essentially, it began with the book and it involves teaming up with musicians, be they classical or hip hop or electronic, whatever, from uh, you know, what's now 80 different countries. Um, and essentially saying, look, would you read the book? I'll give it to you for free. Um, you know, find things in there, plastic pollution, murder, sea slavery, whaling, IUU, what have you, um, that move you personally. Focus on the emotions in the narrative, in the chapter. Um, what are the emotions that, you know, kind of uh, come out from there? That's the shared language between my words and their music. And make an album that um, attempts to sort of convey some of the motion, emotions of the story. And then um, you, we're going to put at your disposal a um, archive that we've built stripped from five years of footage of sounds. And the sounds are ambient, so they're textured sound, machine gun fire in Somalia or chanting Cambodian deckhands in the South China Sea. These are textured interesting ingredients that a musician could use as samples or prose, so with words. That's Secretary of State John Kerry at the UN talking about governance on the oceans. Um, that's an interview with a Tanzanian stowaway. You know, it's just interesting words. And the musician is invited, not obligated, to use these sounds as well. And passages read from the book by me, by someone else with a better voice, by the musician themselves, whatever. Um, we began recruiting and expected this to be five artists and it exploded, it's now 460 artists and 80 countries, 90 million listeners. And the, and the goal here was number one, to reach my 17 year old son. You know, like he won't read the New York Times, he won't read anything I write, um, boring and long and, you know, depressing. Um, but he consumes a lot of information, he's a pretty smart kid. He gets it a lot from comedy and YouTube and TikTok and Spotify and these other watering holes. And the thought was if we could bring, you know, almost a gateway drug out there, sorry to use a terrible metaphor, especially when talking about minors, but like if we could be informationally, you know, sprinkle breadcrumbs from their watering hole, say Spotify, over to our watering hole, say this online article at the Times, then maybe they'll come, you know, and if we can embed these, you know, I'm mixing metaphors terribly, but, you know, if we could embed our stuff, be it footage, these sounds, what have you, um, in the music um, and the album cover and the titling of the songs, maybe people's curiosity will say, I wonder why, what's that from, you know, what's this about? And they will begin clicking over, you know, and it has worked, you know, um, we watched the IP traffic um, and, uh, you know, we, we now have deals with Spotify and Pandora and a bunch of places where they give us more ability to run videos and all sorts of stuff, but it's really interesting. And um, it has brought um, a lot of readers over to the journalism. Uh, and then you're also making musicians sort of cultural informational diplomats of this stuff. And so, boy, I just put out an album on this topic. I better know something about it because I'm going to be interviewed by the, the newspaper here in Rome or, or the radio host here in the Netherlands, you know, and um, so they become fluent in the topic, um, which is great. Um, and then also some of the streaming revenue that comes from the music go anything that we take 50% of any revenue made on the music, we being uh, the Outlaw Ocean Project or Synesthesia Media, and um, and 100% of what we make on it goes right into the nonprofit for more journalism. So there's no profit to be made from the music, but there is a subsidizing source of the journalism. A typical story, the, the, the New Yorker piece costs about $108,000 to produce. Um, that's photographers, security, 
you know, everything you can imagine, video editors, the planes, you know, um, the New Yorkers paying best paying outlet in the country, 8,000 bucks for that story. So, you know, do the math. That's a hundred thousand dollars that it's got to come from somewhere. And that's why, you know, the Washington Post is lucky because they've got Bezos and the New York Times is lucky because they've got Salzburger, but the smaller outlets that are doing this have to find other um, side games. And the music is one um, method that we've found to try to eventually make the journalism sustainable. Um, so to get back to your comfort zone, I would say, um, you know, on the issue of navies, coast guards, and the challenge of law enforcement, um, I do think if there's one major lesson to be learned in the book and the subsequent reporting, it's it's that the layers of problems that exist in the offshore space are distinct from on land, partly because of the sprawling geography, partly because of the jurisdictional complexity of the high seas belonging to no one and everyone, um, but at root and also partly because the way the rules were written typically by industries and and you know kind of lawyers and diplomats rather than by human rights, labor, um, and kind of international law specialists, um, the way the rules were written are distinctly murky. They lean towards, especially in maritime law, privacy of the players, especially in fishing. Um, and furthermore, rules are only as good as their enforcement and the presence of law enforcement who actually will investigate, prosecute, et cetera, um, patrol, um, even near shore waters, not to mention high seas, is non-existent. And so all that together is why you have this robust, somewhat extra legal um, frontier, uh, right, for stories. Why don't I stop there and open it to questions? <laughs>